कॉमेडी शोज and i also have an interest in social issues so i try to follow these issues online and so i hope to be a part of civil services and contribute to the society in some way so your graduation is in sociology your yes. optional is sociology, sociology yes sir you are one of the few candidates whose graduation and optional is matching yes sir so congratulations for that Thank you. So, how did your optional subject help in UPSC? So, well, how did it, how did it help in your administration or whatever UPSC civil services job you get? How does it help? So, I feel sociology helps us have a better understanding of society. It just uh, tells us to not look at what appears on the surface, but try to understand the in-depth causes that may cause the social issues. it also helps us understand what inclusive development actually means we take into account all the stakeholders of society and so i think it has also contributed to increasing my empathy towards different groups so i think it will help in understanding uh, the others better what are the job what are the job uh, you can say opportunities after studying sociology suppose you would not have studied for the bsc what would you do what would you have done so i would have pursued uh, my masters and uh, so ultimately my phd in sociology okay. so uh, we get the opportunity to work as professors and associate with multiple ngos as researchers and surveyors so so i would have preferred uh, to go in that if i wouldn't have joined the bsc no so these are the only job options after studying sociology like going into academic line and or joining or joining in any ngo yes sir in government also sir there are certain options where we can act as uh, uh, researchers or surveyors but so mostly we see that after sociology a lot of people go into specialization as women studies or uh, so any other specialization for child study and so then they pursue uh, that uh, jobs accordingly sir So in a lot of institutions, they also hire these specialists to understand the social issues. So do you mean to say sociology is more of an academic subject? Yes, sir. it is more of an academic subject. And is there scope for actually applying the academics in the field? Enough scope in India now? So currently, the government has uh, been expanding the scope of sociology. I uh, we see a lot of people completing the masters and PhD and then working in multiple institutions, private and government, as researchers. So, so mostly understanding social research is the major job that we get after sociology. But so mostly it is a uh, pure academic only. When did sociology come to India? Like how did it develop? So it originated in Europe. In India, we see that sociology emerged because of the colonial interest. When the East India Company came into India, they wanted to understand the various groups as India was a diverse country. So at that point of time, they started hiring sociologists. to understand the various aspect and frame the laws accordingly that would help them govern the country so these sociologists are educated abroad or uh, who are these sociologists so early sociologists were educated abroad okay. as we do not have multiple institutions in india okay. but once they came to india so for instance uh, we have mn shrinivas and uh, we have gs guri they established institutions in india and then it became a prominent subject in india as well So now it is a prominent subject with well defined syllabus. Yes, sir. It does not have a well defined syllabus because uh, anything and everything can be studied on uh, studied under sociology. For instance, as you said, which is purely seen as a psychological phenomena, uh, sociologists also point out towards the social angle of it. So, so we can study everything. It does not have a very well defined syllabus, but uh, yes, it is more or less codified. More or less codified. Yes. And who has codified it? Like. All these sociologists have been named, or any particular someone has codified. So multiple sociologists have ventured into different areas okay. and expanded the scope of sociology uh, uh, over time. So which is the first college where sociology was taught in India? 
So in India, I believe it was established by G.S. Khurie. Okay. Uh, so it was the Bombay uh, Society. So I am not able to recall the name, but it was in Mumbai. Okay, it was in Bombay, but you are not sure which. Uh, so I am not able to recall the name. Okay, but it was G.S. Khurie. Yes. Sir. Sociology had a very interesting concept regarding bureaucracy. You know, many of the sociologists have given their views on bureaucracy. Yes, sir. So, can you tell a few concepts? You can start with any of the two concepts. You can start with Weber. Yes, sir. So, according to Weber, bureaucracy is a feature of modern society mm -hmm. whereby we need officials to govern a large population and coordinate the work of multiple aspects of society. But, however, he said that bureaucracy over time has become uh, stagnant. It is only following rules. Stagnant. Yes, sir. Did he mention it? Sir, he said that it is only focusing on rule ritualism rather than delving into novelty. Okay. It has become bookish and is leading to a pedantic risk. Okay. Sir, apart from that, we also have uh, Merton who has analyzed the uh, various latent functions of bureaucracy. Okay. So, according to him, one of the functions that bureaucracy does is promote elitism. As the bureaucrats are seen uh, as dif uh, distinct from people and away from people. So, so, he mainly points out the dysfunctions of bureaucracy. So, on the other hand, we also have thinkers like uh, Anthony Giddens, who says that bureaucracy is the only hope for a society in which capitalists are dominating as they are focusing on public welfare. So, what is your take of Indian bureaucracy? It goes with the thought process of Weber or, or Giddens? So, I think bureaucracy has evolved. There was a point of time where uh, we saw bureaucracy as being elitist but now I think the bureaucracy is no more rule based. We have multiple initiatives and we see a lot of initiatives by the officers as well who are more empathetic with the people, who want to connect with the people and make changes that otherwise are outside the rule book. So, so I believe now bureaucrats have become more dynamic. But do you think bureaucrats can work outside the rule book? So following, within, so following the rules but adopting novel approaches. Novel approach. Yes sir. So you don't think Indian bureaucracy is adequacy? Sorry, sir, I, I was not able to hear you. Do you think Indian bureaucracy is adocracy? Do you know what is adocracy? Yes, yes, sir. Do you believe Indian bureaucracy is adocracy? Sir, I don't think so. I think that uh, bureaucracy is functioning in a well organizational manner. Okay. And uh, But I do believe that there is some form of dynamism that we have seen in bureaucracy in the past few years, which I believe, sir, is important for a society like India, which is so diverse. What kind of dynamism are you talking about in bureaucracy that you have seen? In past few years? So, for instance, if I talk about the various initiatives, mm -hmm. so the bureaucrats are trying to connect with the people. So, for instance, mm -hmm. if I talk about, if I can name one bureau, uh, mm -hmm. bureaucrat, uh, yes. uh, Sir Durga Shakti Nathpal, okay. she was uh, connected with the people, and after her suspension, it was the people that went to the government and created some form of request to revoke her suspension. So, so I think that distance and that trust deficit has reduced between a bureaucrat and the citizens. So also we see, for instance, in the education sector, we have seen bureaucrats take very novel approaches. So for instance, uh, Aditya Ranjan sir has taken the Bala initiative. So it's a very simple but a very effective step, which is dynamic but within the rule book. Don't you feel in the long run, if a bureaucrat becomes too much popular with the people, it's a dangerous incident also, where people will start talking about the bureaucrat to governments regarding his posting or suspension or whatsoever. Is that it a dangerous trend? Sir, it is definitely dangerous, but I think, sir, that there has to be some form of connection. And also, there are multiple checks within the bureaucracy that ensures that it does not turn into any form of popularism. Bureaucracy has checks and balances within it. The officers are accountable to the higher level authorities. And so just connecting with the people should be the aim, but it should not be driven by any form of self-interest or to create any form of popular identity, but rather by a spirit of service. Talking about spirit of service, don't you think bureaucrats are nowadays too social media oriented or Facebook, Instagram oriented? Shouldn't they be incognito, serving the nation without being popular? What is your take on it? So I think bureaucrats have, we have a mix in bureaucracy. There are certain officers who are active on social media. What is your take? Which one do you support? So I think we need a presence on social media to create awareness. We awareness need about awareness of the schemes. No, sir, the schemes. Awareness schemes. about the schemes, awareness about the policies that are being taken. Uh, because the social media is a very, uh, is a very important platform to connect with the people. Today, the internet penetration has increased and people are on social media and they might connect more easily 
to the government if the government is active on social media. When you are talking about dynamism in the bureaucracy in the last few years, uh, do you think lateral entry is one of the dynamic initiatives of the government which has changed bureaucracy to an extent? So lateral entry can be seen as a dynamic point uh, because we are bringing expertise and uh, so there are certain fields in which bureaucrats may not be well aware. For instance, if we see the growing science and technology and the AI uh, aspect, the bureaucrats may not be well versed in it and at that point lateral entry may be helpful. So, so I think that is one dynamic aspect. So you are in support of that? So at the higher levels uh, in bureaucracy, I think that is uh, that will he be helpful. Can you name one or two popular lateral entrants? Yes, I am not able to recall in such uh, okay. You see, you are a faculty in Hindu Pratt Academy. Yes, sir. So, you are already preparing others for. Uh, what What is your job in this? Like, it's permanent position. What did you do here? So, I teach class 11 and 12 students in uh, sociology and political science. Class 11 students, you teach sociology. Yes, what sir. do you teach there? Like, is uh, 11, what, 11 12 students sociology like they come to you for coaching in sociology in that academy? Yes, sir. Okay. So, sociology is a new subject and it's, it's introduced in 11 and 12. Yes, sir. Okay. Also, it is seen that you like listening to podcasts on social economy issues. Yes, sir. Any recent podcast that you have listened? So one that I listened to was uh, The Extra Salty by Amrita Ghosh. Okay. The topic was cast in mainstream Bollywood. Cast in mainstream? Bollywood. Just explain in one minute. Like what is cast in mainstream Bollywood? So it was about the representation of cast in uh, various web series and movies. Okay. So we have seen a shift in uh, the idea of how cast are represented. So they are not shown as this degraded section of society who are not educated, which was the earlier case. But now they are shown as these dynamic individuals who have overcome their uh, problems and have gained higher access in society. So however, the problem lies is that we still do not give recognition to people on whom the story is based. That is one aspect that we are not able to include the actual identities. And so secondly, there is still some form of language or some form of cultural barriers that are still reflected in movies in which that there is clarity that scheduled castes look a certain way. For instance, a, a scheduled caste is more or less always shown as dark skin. So, so these are certain issues that are still existing in mainstream Bollywood, but overall the caste representation has improved to a great extent. So caste representation in Bollywood has improved? Yes. You like watching situation or comedy shows? Yes, sir. Which one did you watch recently or you are watching now? Uh, sir, I just completed Modern Family. You completed Modern Family? Yes, sir. Which character do you like the most? Sir, there's this character Gloria. She Gloria. Gloria. She is a Colombian in America and she's married to a white person and uh, it shows the dynamic of the different cultures and how they interact with the other family members. Don't you see often in the show, Gloria, though humanity has been uh, degraded and called a gold digger or something yes, like sir. that, but yes. also her uh, uh, different Latin ethnicity yes, has sir. been shown in, yes, sir. though with a comic timing. Yes, so sir. what do you feel about that? So I think that is one problem that we see in web series even now, that a particular person from a particular ethnicity is shown in a typical way. We are still not able to overcome that barrier. Uh, but sir, in this case, I feel that Gloria enhances or so accepts and is proud of her culture. She does not try to become American. She does not try to hide her ethnicity. She wants her kids to learn uh, Spanish and learn the Colombian culture. So that is why sir, I feel that her presentation is not that of mockery, but rather that of more of acceptance of her own culture. That means eth ethnic jokes or ethnicity or shows regarding any ethnic identity they sell? Sir, so sadly they do. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. 
So, what is the difference between situational comedy and conventional comedy? So, situational comedy is based on a number, on a fixed set of people, and it is mostly shown in a uh, particular episodic format. When we talk about any conventional comedy, it can be any form of movie that uh, may have only one character, beginning, a middle, and the end, and it is not, uh, it is not mostly episodic. It is not focusing on this set of characters and continuing through seasons. It is mostly a three-hour or a four-hour show. So, do you think the comedy shown on Indian television has changed? Because the comedy shows, or the comedy which we uh, categorized as comedy in the seventies or eighties, and the comedy which is brought to us or given to us right now, has it changed over the years? So, I think there is definitely a change. Earlier, the comedy shows. were more of uh, uh, some more of uh, they had a barrier as in they showed certain people or some mockery of someone's culture mockery of someone's accent was seen as something comic but now so it is more on based on real life for instance if we see uh, uh, shows uh, so there's one show called half arranged half love so in this it is basically about a woman who's trying to get married while managing her job So it is based on more on real life, and people relate to it and find it more funny because uh, there is a relatability factor. You know, the now like abusive languages are yes, very much a part of comedy shows. Yes. So like, so what do what is your take on that? So, so now right now the current generation like finds abusive languages a very very funny thing, or it is regularly used in all comedy shows. Yes. So what is what is So I why is it that? So I think so abusive uh, students. So why is is this happening, or why such uh, things are very accepted right now? Even even dialogues in Hindi movies, uh, abuses have become very mainstream. So as a sociology student, why do you think such a change has happened? So firstly, I think that it is very unfortunate that we are showing such characters and using such dialogues in our movies. But sir, I think that the movies adopt these dialogues because the society is, uh, sir, the society has these elements. It I don't think it is the other way around. I don't, sir. There is definitely an element of influence of such dialogues. But I think movies and sitcoms are using these dialogues because the society uses these dialogues, and they are just trying to create a virtual society through their medium. So, so I think because they know that people will relate to it. People will understand, and people will think that is how the way we talk. So, because of that, I think they are using such languages. Okay. But don't you think the society always used such languages, but it was not depicted in movies or not shown in movies? So, I think there has been a shift in values when we talk about being liberal and freedom of speech and expression. That has more space in today's society, and earlier these spaces were more restricted because of mora- morality. But now, so uh, people want to see everything in a very raw form, and therefore there is more acceptance of such ideas in society. Okay. So you have studied film studies along with sociology and political science. Yes, sir. So can you please elaborate on what have you taught? So in film well? studies, we basically studied the production part rather than the pre-production and post-production. So, so a few angles of cameras and uh, how can we use light. That we studied, and apart from that, we also studied certain schools. Uh, a few that I can think of is German Expressionism and Italian Noir, and how the Bollywood has evolved from the 1950s to early 2000s. <coughs> There has been a significant evolution in mainstream Bollywood. We we basically try to understand what were the major changes that occurred then. So, what do you think is the main impetus behind this explosion of? Web series or OTT OTT platforms. Like, do you think that more people are moving from the TV or big screens, or uh, that TV is becoming redundant and Indians? <coughs> so I think TV has reduced to a great extent, and people have moved to these platforms. Sorry, sir. People have moved to these platforms. So the major reason being is that accessibility has become more easier. So today we have these platforms that can be seen on mobile phones. And internet penetration is also increasing in India. So because of that, uh, so there has uh, been an explosion in these OTT platforms. So, uh, is social media science or it is pure arts? So it's a social science. It's a social science. Yes. So what elements of science does it include? So sociology is not a vague understanding of any topic. So if 
so according the uh, science is not any body of knowledge rather when we try to arrive at the truth through certain fixed methods so it has to be reliable it has to be valid the sociology before claiming any theory so it follows a fixed rigorous step of methods there is a sample that is fixed research is collected uh, that research <coughs> is peer reviewed and then that is published as a theory while also claiming that particular theory will only be valid in particular context it will not be a universal theory unlike natural sciences so like it means uh, social studies do a lot of survey yes sir. so what are the elements of a good survey so the elements of a good survey so it depends on what kind of questionnaire we are preparing so it can be open ended or closed ended so but mostly the questions has to be simple it has to be short so that the uh, the so the participant is not uh, bored by it so the next thing is that it should not be leading it should not uh, point to any answer and it should be a uh, very in a very simple language also so apart from that two principles are very important one is that it has to be random that the participants have to be selected randomly and secondly it has to be stratified as well so a particular uh, age group also has to be considered for instance if i'm trying to understand an, uh, any aspect of a male population i will consider the various age groups of that male population so so randomization and stratification are also very important in survey so as a, as a policy maker yes, so in a diverse society so what do you think what are the steps you will take to formulate a policy i'm sorry so uh, what kind of policy any policy be it for example to implement any education policy or in education we <coughs> will create uh, or frame a policy yes, so what are the steps you will take to frame a policy so first we are try to collect the data as to what the problem is in that a uh, particular area so for instance in the education sector i will try to understand whether the problem is with enrollment or whether the problem is with retention or the problem is with learning outcomes so accordingly i will frame my policy secondly so i will also try to understand that uh, different groups may have different reasons for not pursuing something so so i will also try to understand those reasons and act accordingly a uh, uniform approach may be difficult so so some form of incentives and disincentives to different sectors maybe uh, uh, maybe helpful sir so but in a, like how to execute a policy especially in such a diverse uh, society like india so in order to execute so because most of our policies are 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 formulated at a simple level yes sir so how difficult it is uh, or how successful it is to execute such policies at a local level what are the major challenges do you think So I think the major challenge is that the policies may not consider the local level issues with the with a particular district. So the policy has a uniform approach rather than a localized approach. So secondly, I feel that the people may not be aware of this thing. So even if a policy is existing, people may not be aware that they can benefit from such a scheme. So thirdly, I think inclusion exclusion errors are a major issue in any policy. that can also be dealt with and uh, so another major area where i feel is that uh, the uh, the uh, administrative hurdles and barriers in implementing the particular policy uh, may be a cause of concerns so what is your take on so many uh, student suicides which are happening so as a society what does it indicate so unfortunately we do see india is witnessing a lot of student suicides so it is simply showing that there is increasing competition in india and maybe exams are creating an additional burden so the students are not being aware of the fact that it is just an exam and their entire life will not be dependent on it so secondly there is increasing pressure from parents from peers and from academic institutions to perform exceptionally well in order to get into any decent college so that creates a burden and so thirdly i think there is some form of stigmatization in mental health awareness still continues so so talking about anxiety panic attacks depression is still not very accepted especially among the uh, teenagers and so i think that can lead to loneliness and lead to such acts so what would you, uh, your advice be to especially families because families are at the core of creating yes. such pressures peer pressure so what what would be your advice for families especially where both the parents are working so i believe when both the parents are working they mostly uh, enroll their child in some coaching institution so so i think first advice is to let them understand and a uh, first advice would be uh, for them to connect with the child that the the uh, the child is still 
uh, theirs and they should connect with the child continuously not leave the child to deal with his or her own problems and secondly is uh, the parents need to be uh, made aware that there are multiple opportunities in india rather than certain selected occupations and even if a child does not get into one occupation there are multiple other avenues that the child can uh, uh, take so so i think that awareness will also help uh, the parents and as a policy maker what ingredients will you will you put or will be uh, like putting in the national education policy to tackle such incidents so firstly in the national education policy i believe there has to be a target that, that we want to reduce the suicide rates by to from this percentage to such an extent by this year so i think uh, setting a target will help me implement the policy better so secondly i think uh, that biometric a target that suicide should be reduced yes sir and it's like having an agriculture policy where they are setting a target that this should be the amount of suicides no sir i'm not saying that this should be the amount of suicide i'm just saying sir no, that if you reach that target that means we are happy with 5 10 20 suicides no sir i am not but sir the thing is that we cannot claim in india in a country like india with so much competition and uh, less employment opportunities that students suicide will completely be eliminated it can definitely be reduced sir and hopefully eliminated over a period of time uh, but sir we have to take it uh, gradually it so what are the ingredients you will integrate into the national education policy to address such issues so i think firstly uh, tracking the attendance of the children by every school every institution is a must so if a child is absent for two days or more we can try to understand the reason behind it and see whether such issues uh, whether he is facing Don't such issues inclusive no so i think attendance tracking is a must for yes, any but getting into the reason why the person is absent for two days only to be too inclusive so if we are dealing with cases of anxiety and depression uh, we have to be a little inclusive in such cases so secondly i feel that uh, we can also we should create mental health clubs and provide psychosocial support to the children especially the ones who are appearing for very important examinations like boards so thirdly we can uh, have these so like recently the prime minister conducted the pariksha which is a uh, charcha we can also bring out so important that elements of a policy like could be this can be an element of element in the policy where you say that prime minister should be so what are the elements in a policy you should we recommend or should so i think absolutely. mental health clubs will be the way forward so every institution should also have a certified counselor who can guide the child uh, through the phase of depression and uh, so there has to be some form of destigmatization as well about the mental health anxiety depression and panic attacks and uh, so if we can uh, that may again seem intrusive but so peer uh, peers can help us in understanding which child is facing problems so so if we uh, uh, help we form peer groups and we uh, in uh, uh, so we uh, approach them i think so that can also be helpful see i can see that you have been preparing for long now yes sir don't you think you are wasting your time uh, by preparing for so long so my ultimate aim is civil services so i want to serve the society through bureaucracy and uh, so i am sitting here for the interview so i don't think uh, so my time is wasted don't you think that you could have actually pursued sociology it's 6 years now that we see you are pursuing for civil services and it's prime uh, age of when you know you can be uh, you can take up a lot of other aspirations don't you think that youth today is wasting their time in civil service so i think the youth today is following the passion so we can't always run after productivity uh, we also sometimes have to run behind what we want and it may take a little more time but i think so if we achieve it then uh, it will be worth it so for you passion is important productivity is not so both are important and while i am preparing for upsc i am being productive because i am learning about multiple things and also so i have been working uh, for two years so i think so i have a balance of productivity as well as following my passion so what is the time limit one should have while pursuing his or her passion uh, and then one should take a plan b the yeah, passion sounds good you know but then is it realistic for the society what you think is the time limit to draw a line to passion and then uh, be realistic so i think it's very difficult to put a time limit 
to passion sir because it it is something uh, like an inner calling which we want to pursue yes sir there should always be plan b but i believe someone who's passionate uh, will achieve their goal and sir if not they will also learn a lot of things from their passion which can later be used in society uh, but sir i think it's very difficult to put a time limit as to what should be the plan b and when that should be I can see that uh, you have not given preference to Indian police service. Yes. Uh, after waiting for so long to get into civil service, why have you not opted for Indian police service and foreign service? So my preference is Indian administration service. When I was studying Indian society, I wanted to be a part of the policy uh, issues and policy formulation. And crime and uh, law and order and criminal investigation has never interested me a lot. I believe that I will be more apt if I am uh, put into administration and policy formulation. Is administration complete without law and order? No, sir. Definitely, it is not. But uh, sir, it's about specialization. I believe Indian police service is more specialized to deal with law and order and crime matters, while administration services are more equipped with policy formulation. Don't you think you will not be a right fit for Indian? Revenue service, which is your second and third preference, coming from sociology. No, sir. I think I will be a right fit for Indian revenue service as well, uh, sir. Because India is a growing economy, it is definitely a sought after service. And sir, while I have pursued sociology in my graduation, coming into UPSC, I have learned multiple new subjects, and I am always willing to learn them. So I think, sir, if I go into revenue service, I will learn whatever it takes to be a good officer, and I will act accordingly. So, my last question: uh, What gratitude, as you write gratitude journal, yes, what gratitude one poor should have in India who is not being offered job and basic meal, free time meal, by the government? So, for someone who is poor who is not getting the basic services, it is very difficult to offer gratitude. But sir, if we try to look at the good aspects, they can be grateful for a healthy body, for a family. So how can they... one be healthy without food? So I meant as in a uh, so basic. Uh, so they are not physically fit, definitely, but uh, so they won't they... be mentally fit also. So they won't be mentally fit also. Uh, so that is definitely a point. But sir, I believe that if we try to look at the grateful aspects. They can be grateful for uh, so being a citizen, and so there are multiple schemes that the government provides them. So, so if they are availing these schemes, they can be grateful for the uh, welfare schemes that the society or the government has created. Don't you think gratitude is a luxury, not for the? Uh, uh, it's not for everyone. So a, I think gratitude is an outlook rather than a luxury. So one who is not having anything can also have gratitude. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.